anytime I'm just living my life and somebody is upset with me, it's just almost always not my fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. It just happens to be that way. I don't know if it's just like a, a coincidence field, like a metaphysical coincidence field that surrounds me or whatever. But it just so happens that almost <laughs> every time anyone's mad at me, it's not my fault. So you're blaming it on ghosts. Well, I, I don't know what it is. It could just be... Um, you said I'm a, the word metaphysical specifically. That yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean dead spirits are running around does. knocking stuff over. It could just mean that I have like a... Uh, I have a spiritual field that emanates from me that causes everybody to think everything's my fault. And it's just, it never is actually. You know, I thought there was something weird about you when we met. There was like this weird aura around you. Is that the metaphysical barrier? Yeah, you just started thinking like, it's his fault. But Yeah, like it's your fault. But the truth is it wasn't. Like I ordered a slice of pizza that was way too big. And that's not my fault. Felt like your fault. (laughs) Yeah, but I'm telling you, I mean, it seems (laughs) even now, as you're saying it, it's starting to feel like you think it was my fault, but I'm telling you it was your fault. You didn't stop me, and you should have stopped me. Okay, I'm telling you it wasn't my fault. (laughs) Now you know about the metaphysical uh, field that surrounds me (laughs) that makes everybody think it's my fault, but and you still think it's my fault, so I think that's on you. I do. And do you need an exorcism or something? How do we fix it? Are you telling me? Hold on. (laughs) Now you're (laughs) blaming me for not getting an exorcism. So you're telling me (laughs) that the metaphysical field that makes everyone think things are my fault is also my fault. You know, it also makes you a little defensive. (laughs) Just putting that out there. Pushing Up Roses here. With me is the most exhilarating, the metaphysical, the supernatural, everything is his fault, Matt Ockham. Well, well, Hi, Matt. I think you got the wrong message from the cold open. It's The thing is, it's not my fault. Hey, how's it going, Moses? <laughs> uh, welcome back to Save Your Game. We have got a great episode for you today. You know it's going to be great when... I am gushy about something when I'm just start and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> so excited. I already probably put out way too many tweets about my excitement, but that's okay. That's <laughs> what we're here for. We're here to be excited about adventure games. Yeah. You know, and it feels like I haven't, I haven't talked to you in so long. I know it's been days. It has been three days since we it's recorded the last days. episode. <laughs> it's been 84 years. Besides what we've been playing for this show today, have you played anything? No. (laughs) (laughs) But I did download, I did do a couple things. I I streamed Duck Detective for my fans and we had a great time. And I downloaded, sorry, I already had it. I installed uh, Strange Horticulture. And that's the game that I might take a look at next. Ooh, that game. I really enjoy that game. And they just announced a sequel, so. Oh, wow. Cool. It's one of those games that is is deceptive, I'm, I feel like, because I looked at the screen. Obviously, I watched the trailer. I looked at the screen caps on Steam and I'm like, OK, all right, where 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 could this possibly go? But when you read the <laughs> reviews, everyone's like, this is a fantastic game. It is my favorite game. I'm like, OK, I'm sold. You don't you don't have to. Wow. Uh, I'm sold. Favorite game feels a little strong for Strange Horticulture, but hey, to each their own. Yeah. I liked it a lot. Great. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to Strange Antiquities is their next Ooh, game. I yeah. like that. I like the sound of that. <laughs> I like um, haunted items. So I also uh, did more downloading than playing. I um, actually, <laughs> we are reviewing two games from Postmodern Adventures today. And this guy, uh, Jose Maria Melendez, who wrote and you know, he was the developer basically on both games mm-hmm. uh, that we're talking about today. He also did a couple more before this that were also sort of more, they were a little more throwback. Like these are, yeah. these have pixel art and they're point and click games, but I don't know that I'd necessarily call them throwbacks. They have a real modern feel to them. Yeah. 
which is <laughs> ironic since they're both period pieces. But yeah, uh, yeah, they are. <laughs> uh, but he did two other games, um, one of which is called Billy Masters Was Right, and mm-hmm. the other one is called Urban Witch Story. And I'm really excited to play both of them. So maybe I'll have yeah, those fall in line almost with a. Uh... It's like Maniac Mansion. They're they're older. They're older looking if you compare them to Nightmare Frames and An English Haunting, which are the ones we're going to be talking about today. And you're yeah. right, even though they they are pixel art, uh, the English Haunting and Nightmare Frames they do have a modern feel to it. They feel way more modern than the devs' previous two games, which I don't think you can even play on Steam. I think you can download them on Itch Itchio though. Uh, yeah, they're is that both how you on. Pronounce that? You know, I don't even know. <laughs> I just say itch.io, which is more work, but you know what? Hey, I'm just gonna say itch.io. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. I'm still playing Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. I am completely and utterly stuck. Oh no! <laughs> I'm just, I'm just walking around looking at all the puzzles again, and oh, I have no. no idea what to do next. So, um, hey, is if anyone wants to send time? me some. No, I I think again, like um, kind of like Animal Well that I mm-hmm. like I've been talking about. I, this is another one of those games where it's like the struggling against the puzzles is sort of the point. So mm-hmm. I feel like I'm going to be frustrated with myself if I look up a walkthrough because the puzzles are more the point than the um like than the progression than the story. Yeah. It's like The Witness, right? There's no point in playing The Witness. Yeah. Besides solving the puzzles in The Witness. Right. If yeah, it's you... one of those. Right. Once you, yeah. if you, if somebody solves the puzzle for you, what? You get to walk five steps forward? <laughs> like, that's yeah. not, like, there's no gameplay for you there. There's no it's story. Like, yeah. It's like cheating at Sudoku or something. <laughs> right. Like, well, yeah, yeah. You just maybe you just like to see every box filled in with a number. <laughs> like that's yeah. then you could just write any numbers in those boxes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe I'll talk about it on the show at some point. I think the witness is a masterpiece, but I also understand why some people wouldn't enjoy because that again, that's all it is is puzzles yeah. that are hard. And the fact that you maybe can't solve them is the point. Like you're supposed yeah. to be climbing uphill. It's uh, you know, it's like um, uh, like getting over it with Bennett Foddy, but for the for the mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not my type of game, but I I do recognize it as like a very well done game that has a lot of fans, and that's great. All right, we should jump into our next segment because we have a do lot it. to talk about. Let's do it. I'm not even going to play the music. Let's do it. I'm oh, ready. Whoa, what? what? Uh. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, we talk about the game, Matt. Okay. Are you not prepared? No. This is your fault. <laughs> oh, play the music. <laughs> Oh my god, okay. Thanks for playing the music. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> this is Save Your Game. I'm Matt Okay, if this is Pushing Up Roses, how's your break? It was good. It sounded like you had a panic attack. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, it's like you almost made me roll into a segment with no uh, transitional music. That all, <laughs> no that, music. I'm, it's, I can feel the sweat just <laughs> pouring from my skin when you say that. Sweating so hard. That's just the kind of person I am. <laughs> Just, just keep go keep you on your toes make you yeah. just uh you, you don't know which way it's coming from did, did you feel that in person did you feel like i was just like about to ambush people at any second <laughs> yeah i i kept bobbing and weaving because i kept thinking you were gonna throw punches at me and you know <laughs> people should know i'm unpunchable i can He's dodge anything yeah. yeah um but still you, you have to when you're up against a chaotic force like pushing up roses, you really, yeah, you really have to look out. That's why you were like 
shuffling about like so erratically. Mm-hmm. I was wondering. I kept popping up behind, like I kept like disappearing <laughs> and then popping up behind the strangers in the street <laughs> in the middle of a conversation. I was like, hey, good point. And then I disappear behind their back. Probably because I was seething that you let me buy a pizza slice that was too big. It's not my fault. Okay, do you want to talk about, uh, okay, there was a game. What? It was. There was a game. <laughs> they made one. Sweet. <laughs> they made a. They made a game. Uh, it was released in uh, uh, twenty twenty two by yeah. Postmodern Adventures. It's a game called Nightmare Frames. Um, and night Nightmare Frames is a. Uh, it's a story that takes place in nineteen eighty five. I believe. Yes, in my favorite. I love a time piece. I love like a timed game like that. I'm so excited. Go on. You play, you play <laughs> horror screenwriter. I believe in the last episode, I just called him a horror writer, which probably made everybody think that it was like a novelist, but he's a, he's a, oh, right. he's a screenwriter mainly of horrors like slasher films. Yes. Um, and mainly, his name is, mainly slasher. He wants to break into like Oscar pieces, but he, uh, is stuck in the slasher genre. His name is Alan Goldberg. Um, he has a cute little beard. You know, <laughs> here's the thing. I like his pixel art portrait, like hi- him as a pixel art character, a yeah, lot do. better than the detailed portrait they have of him. Oh, I love the detailed portraits. Really? I, I, I really do love them. Yeah, I really do. Well, lo- I'll, and I'll explain. I'll explain why. I'm not I saying do. I don't like the detailed portraits. I'm saying for Alan Goldberg... Mm. I think he looks like a real douchebag in his detailed portrait. He is but, a douchebag. But the Alan Goldberg pixel ca- creature that we uh-huh. walk around the screen uh-huh. uh, looks like a, just like a cute little cute adventure little guy. game guy. <laughs> yeah, a cute, cute, weird little guy. Uh, I mean, it works for me because Alan is a douchebag. He That's is, true. He is, he, he's unlikable for a little while, um, which is fine. I you know I like a I like a a growth arc, a glow up I guess. Yeah, <laughs> well, and moral terms. glow up. Yeah, a moral glow up. Yeah, we've all had them, except for me. I'm still going through mine. <laughs> but, one day. Yeah, one day I'll get there. Mm. But yeah, um, I I loved this game. I yeah. loved this game, and I and you kind of called it, Matt. You're like, I think we should. When we were talking about doing this, we wanted to cover both games by this dev, uh, or at least their their latest their latest games. And you're like, I think you're I think you're really gonna like Nightmare Frames. I'm like, all right, yeah. we'll see. I looked at the screen caps and I'm like, what is this Harvester? <laughs> really, that's what I thought. <laughs> it's very gory, yeah. Yeah, the, some of the screen caps that come up are are a little gory, and and then they've got those portraits as well. And I was like, okay, well, what's the quality on this going to be like? I was pleasantly surprised by how much I I truly loved this game. Mm-hmm. Um, probably more than it, than an English haunting, which is very surprising for me. Both of these games are aesthetically and you know, concept wise, they were they are for me. I I, I right. I love ghosts and hauntings and I love horror and I love the eighties. And because this is set in the eighties, it's just got an aesthetic, a vibe that I'm so drawn to. I, I, Oh my God. I, I really liked it. (laughs) I mean, let's say this post, the, the postmodern adventures, right. Um, This guy, Jose Maria Melendez Mm -hmm. is a pixel art genius, (laughs) right? His, I, I'm struggling to think of, I, I can think of a lot of people that do good pixel art that's around the same level. I can, I'm struggling to think of anyone who does it better than this. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Just the, ah, <laughs> I really like, like this game, you guys. Like I thought, I I love the pixel art. You You really have to play it in motion because if you just look up the screen caps and you see kind of the, the gorier parts, I don't think it... It's kind of like Hobbs Barrow, right? You look at right. some of those screen caps when they're not in motion, and you're like, "Ugh, I don't know if I like that." But if you play this game in motion with the background music, with the portraits and the dialogue, right? It, it's it is a little. I feel like it's a little masterpiece. Honestly, I really do. Yeah, I, I, the and the story is like uh, is pretty robust. You know, okay, so 
why don't we go through it a little bit? You start yeah. as Alan Goldberg. You are looking to make your next movie. You have a tentative deal um, with this sort of big name Hollywood producer, Peter Evans, who's going to let you break out of the slasher genre. Yeah. He, he kind of wants to go and like, I don't know how, how many viewers are alive in the 80s. I hope a lot because we're, we're of that generation. But uh, <laughs> he kind of wants to get out of the, you know, the slasher genre. And when I say slasher, I mean the ones that were very popular at the time. So Nightmare on Elm Street, the Jason movies, maybe Halloween. I, I think that's Halloween is a little more subdued, but you get what I mean. He's working on a movie called like Lunatic. <laughs> lunatic yeah he's 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 in the middle of writing lunatic 2 and he realizes that he's written the exact same ending as lunatic 1 and yeah so he needs to go back to the drawing board um, correct and it's if you the intro of the game it puts you in his, in his story that he's playing lunatic 2 and right yeah. away I, I at least i knew right away i was in somebody's head i'm just like oh this okay. isn't the game i'm playing a uh, uh i'm playing like a friday the 13th type okay. of thing there's a camp there are kids it's a really i don't want to spoil much it's a really great transition into the game and it really it sets the tone for being kind of gripping right away mm -hmm. i felt that an english haunting just as a quick tone comparison was slower I felt that Nightmare Frames kept me engaged basically the whole time. But yeah, he's working on Lunatic 2. He would rather be writing dramas uh, in line with like Terms of Endearment. I forget what his... his <laughs> it's, called, it's called Melodies of Heaven. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like on point. Yeah, he yeah wants to do, absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, he wants to do that. I don't know why. And he's just very salty about it, to be honest. And you, you kind of get the, it's kind of interesting to watch someone be salty about their job to the point of almost being ungrateful. It's weird. It's weird. It's a weird tone that they There's, give this guy. I, I always think this is a little bit funny. Uh, how many books and movies and TV shows uh, and plays and now video games are about this thing, like the tortured writer who mm -hmm. doesn't want to be writing the things that they're writing anymore. Because yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's so like, this is clearly something that's important to a writer and not to anybody. Like anybody else would be like, oh, just get a different job then. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah. but like, like one of my favorite movies of all times time is a thousand clowns with jason robards uh based okay. on a based on a play and it's that it's a man who's writing for um he, he's writing for children's shows tv shows and he wants to write for more serious things he's like sick of what the the box that the children's show producers keep putting him in um but he also has a uh not legally adopted child that he's a guardian of mm -hmm. he's like his sister's kid and then he runs the risk of losing this kid if he doesn't have a job that is steady and then it's this it's this push and pull about you know um do i set a role model for this kid and possibly lose him or do i lose this kid's respect and then mm -hmm. but anyway my point I just had to talk about Thousand Clouds for a second. My point being, I think it's really funny, this idea of writers thinking of writers as heroes <laughs> and, write, and writers yeah. thinking of writers struggles as like life or death and like the biggest things a person can encounter. It's very dark half by Stephen King, which is also about a writer. Stephen King is a writer that writes about the tortured writer. I don't know if you guys <laughs> noticed that. Right. It's subtle, but it's there. So he has this yeah he has this um deal with peter evans the producer um and he thinks it's gonna be his ticket out and then he finds out peter evans is dead yeah that's like the first thing that, that you find out in the game <laughs> yeah um and you kind of it becomes a, a kind of like a a, a a sort of an investigation game you're, you're not really sure where it's gonna go because mm -hmm. He wants to know what happened to Peter Evans just because he's frustrated yeah. about what just happened to his career. Um, but that doesn't feel like a very, very strong um, motive 
for right. somebody to go to like on a whole game long adventure. Right. Um, I don't know. What did you think at that part? Like, what did you think this game was going to be? So the means of which uh, Peter Evans died, that was enough for me to at least be like, well, something obviously is going on. They kind of foreshadow uh, basically. And obviously there's going to be a couple spoilers. I don't think this is a, a terrible spoiler because this is the, this is how you start the yeah, game. Yeah. First 10 minutes yeah. of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't even worry about that. But Peter Evans, they find that he took his own life. And Alan is very bewildered by this because he was a, a huge person in film. You know, he back, he was going to back his project. He had a quote, everything, a mansion, the life money. Uh, so why would he take his life? So at that point, I mean, keep in mind, I played English haunting first. So I, I had a feeling it could go in a different direction, but at that point right. in the game, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this will stay grounded and I have to investigate something like that happened with, with the suicide and like there's some conspiracy. Yeah. Like on. there's yeah. a conspiracy. Yeah. Like it, it leads you to believe there's a conspiracy and that's how the game starts. Um. So, but now this guy, because he's been such a dick about his own career, he's closed off a lot of, venues <laughs> in hollywood he's like made a lot of enemies so as he starts investigating this thing he finds like every time he's about to get a piece of information he he's almost like cut off mm -hmm. from that piece of information by somebody that he pissed off right yeah, <laughs> doesn't yeah. he's made a him. lot of enemies nobody likes him including his ex slash maybe girlfriend yeah it's never totally clear if like she definitely breaks up with him but he they seem like they're still together the few other times they interact so i don't know it's one of those like very 80s movie relationships where it's like that is the love interest whether they're broken up or not like that's the girl and everything is extremely 80s including the background music see i don't think they used actual songs but if they didn't they are very like there there's a diner that you frequent and that's where mm -hmm. your ex slash love interest works it's the most 80s thing you'll ever see there's yeah. 80s mu music playing there's 80s television on the screen there's an 80s trivia arcade game <laughs> yes <laughs> which can... i coiled over you can answer 80s trivia questions i got most of the movies right i was pretty proud of myself um and there, there is a song that plays in there that I swear is Depeche Mode. I just swear by it. It sounds so good. It's definitely Depeche Mode style. And yeah. uh, they do a really interesting and funny thing where, like, the TV is just on in the diner like it is in places. And yeah. there's, you know, announcers talking and saying real words and then songs in between. Like, it's really... It does a good job of, and this guy is, uh, Postmodern Adventures is great at this. Um, mm -hmm. Does it in an English haunting, does it in this game, where the places that you go to sound like those places. They're playing yeah. period uh, appropriate music. Um, mm -hmm. They have like sounds going on. Again, in this scenario, you have a TV that is actually talking. It really puts you in the place you're supposed to be in the time you're supposed to be. So you go through a couple of things, you know, it's it's standard point and click stuff. You keep running into roadblocks and you have to think of clever ways around them. You get your girlfriend an acting job. I would say basically you're doing basically you're unlocking the game in that first part of LA. So right. you're, you are in LA, you are a screenwriter. Obviously you're not going to be anywhere else, but LA because much to maybe our surprise and your surprise and the viewer's surprise or the player's surprise. It's not about the story is not about Peter Evans. Not really. No. Um, as we're doing stuff, we come to find that there is a filmmaker that all other horror filmmakers aspire to be like, and his name is Edward Keller. Mm -hmm. and he apparently did the the scariest and by the way we looked him up he's not real not real <laughs> these games name drop real people this person's not real for good reason yeah a lot of the big named characters are not real people yeah. but uh they all the world references real people constantly yes. and the not real people are so 
like perfectly grounded in the world that you wonder constantly oh is this that a real you person? wonder this- yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because it is it is you know that is that low fantasy urban fantasy it takes place in a real place mm. you know possibly with real people but weird stuff is happening so yeah. we learn about edward keller it seems like a, a very small group of people know about him uh but he has vanished he he made the scariest movie of all time. He was going to make another movie, but he vanished. Nobody like knows a long time ago too. Yeah, yeah, like a long time ago. And during our little fetch quest, uh, a director <laughs> that we get that we help to uh, cast people in. Sorry, not a director. What what would you call that guy? That sleaze guy. <laughs> Who would you call um, that guy? He's a, I think he's a pro- producer because he's looking yeah. for a director and an actress. Uh, he's just yeah. like throwing people together in studios and being like, we're making a movie here. <laughs> yeah, we're, make, we're making a movie. <laughs> Got a face for radio. No, he, he, we help him out. We find him a director. We find him an actress. And he's like, you know what, kid? I like your moxie. He doesn't say that, but it's what I say. <laughs> like your moxie. You should go talk to this amazing woman who can make your dreams come true. Go talk. To, and at first, our character's like, I don't really want to. And he's like, no, go doctor. So we end up in this rich woman's house, this woman with a lot of influence uh, named Helen Westmore. Yeah. And you don't quite know what to make of her at first. She's kind of portrayed as this very lovely, nice woman who can just Mm -hmm. make your dreams come true. She is the, uh, she's like the legendary figure of like the kingmaker uh, that, that Hollywood that everyone believes exists in Hollywood and who knows, maybe it does, but she is this incredibly rich person who just plucks somebody out of their lives and turns them into the most powerful people in Hollywood. She's yeah. like a, a, a kingmaker. Yeah. And she, she noticed us being able to, I guess, do these fetch quests. Man, if you're in an adventure game and you do fetch quests and somebody sees you, they're like, oh yeah, that person, they're a seeker and they're special. (laughs) So she's like, yeah, you're special. I think you could help me out. I am looking for that second, uh, that second film that Edward Keller made. Yeah, she's a horror aficionado. I think that's why she took interest in us in the first place. Uh, she already knew we were working on Lunatic 2. She's very interested in us. <laughs> it is It is not proven that this film exists, but it is up to us to find it. And so now we're on this, this quest, this journey, to figure out as much as we can about Edward Keller, who is a very strange character. Um, it is speculated, that part of the reason why he's so notorious in hor- horror is that he speculated to have not used special effects. They're basically saying he made a snuff film for uh for his his notorious film called like Bloody Mind Games, I think it's called. Right. It's it's another that's like another Hollywood legend, right? Yes. It's these ideas of uh these horror films were actually people actually died and no one's ever seen the actors again and 201 those have all been disproven <laughs> yeah, yeah um unless they are like an actual snuff film which i'm sure does exist but we're not gonna well, look into that nobody's ever been able to discover one that's been made for commercial distribution uh yeah there have been like serial killers who recorded their for murders sure. there have been people that like murdered people on facebook live or whatever but yeah. there's never been up to this date uh a recorded like or a confirmed case of like i'm making a snuff film right like went to the theaters was widely distributed or or even was distributed on the black market is like you gotta watch this yeah you know like all of those have been disproven even the ones that are very realistic are often just like yeah, fake. Yeah, the, the game has one... all these tropes, you know, all these '80s horror tropes uh, like that, it, like the the rumor. Was it Cannibal Holocaust? Was the one where I heard there was like a court case where they had to bring, or there was going like somebody was going to bring charges against the filmmaker, and the actors had to like show up and be like, "I'm alive." Oh my god! 
<laughs> that, it might be <laughs> apocryphal. I don't know. Maybe. It, it, it also, you know, you can look at the old John Waters films, too, because they did, they did real stuff in those films uh, that are not good. allowed today. Yeah. Again, not allowed today. It should have never been allowed, but it, it's yeah. there. But not I mean, quite, even like not quite along. Not Not <laughs> quite on, along the lines of killing people on film in a widely distributed thing. But the, this right. game really does take those like '80s horror tropes and use them to its advantage. Therefore, I loved it. I, I loved everything we're talking <laughs> about, and I loved. Um, it's, it's no at that point in the game, I still thought that we were grounded. You know what I mean? I'm right. like, okay, we'll find this filmmaker, whatever. We're going around LA. We're we're getting information on this filmmaker. I still think we're pretty grounded. We're doing 80s things. You know, we're we're punching pedophiles in the face. That's always fun. We're, uh, yeah, there's we're, a there's an Elvira. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Eliza. Pastiche. Her name is Eliza in this. And game. I love her because, of course, I love her. It was, it was just, it, man, it brings the nostalgia in a very real way. There's also, you also get like pulled into the back of a car by some yeah. other <laughs> yeah. big wig, uh, big wig Hollywood hotshot who's like, I actually want the film, and you better do it for me. Um, and we're like, yeah, no. just like a lot of Hollywood pastiches, and oh, you go, you get cocaine. At one point. That's true. For medical purposes, I just want to point out. For medical right. purposes. <laughs> what what you start to find out, and again, more Hollywood pastiche, especially 1980s Hollywood pastiche, um, this Edward Keller has been at least tangentially involved in a bunch of uh, satanic cults. Um, yes. And some of those satanic cult members are now in uh, non-satanic cults. Like they they're still in they the like cult business, on. yeah. But they've divested themselves from Satanism, um, and then some are still in like LSD, yeah, demon worshiping cults. It's very. Uh, some of that reminds me almost of like nineteen sixties music scene uh, with um, like Charles Manson and his affiliations with like the Beach Boys and the houses they had and and what they did and and those these cult houses kind of reminded me of that. There's also another part that is very reminiscent of Heaven's Gate. Yes. But not quite as not quite as severe. Uh, not quite. Yeah, Everybody's alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's that what that's what we need the cocaine for. I'm just letting you guys know. <laughs> it's for medical purposes. Um so then we're getting all this insane information about Edward Keller and kind of his character that he was in a cult that he was uh worshiping Satan doing strange things um and then you start to wonder if there's any merit to him doing strange things for his films and we finally get a lead that takes us out of LA mm-hmm. and I think this is such a brilliant transition because again the first part of LA we are really doing a Gabriel Knight-esque investigation we're trying to get a lead to bring us somewhere else that's going to ramp up so right. this lead brings us to a town where he was last seen called serena and it is a horror slasher movie town through <laughs> yeah. and through there's not so a lot of now, residents you know the yeah. residents that are there are weird and the bus driver refuses to drive into the yeah. town. He lets you out outside the town in the rain. And he's like, I'm not going no further. You yeah. you go on ahead. Half a, Yeah, he's like, it's only half a mile. Just walk. <laughs> so we end up walking there. And again, it's it's very, the 80s comes through. This We're in this desolate town. We get arrested immediately because, because we are new. And if you go to a small town and you are new, people are going to be sus of you. It's just how it is. So Especially getting... small town like this, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, where everybody's getting killed or maimed or uh, insane all the time. Yeah, this is where I think the game starts its its supernatural journey. The first part, the LA part, not really. It's pretty grounded. Like I said, it's very Gabriel Knight. And then, if you recall in Gabriel Knight, you do a lot of grounded stuff, and then you don't. Then you're. Right. <laughs> You know, you're, you've traveled elsewhere and you're doing something else now. And that's kind of what it reminded me of. So we're in this town of Serena. We get arrested this, by, go ahead. This, this is like the half point of the game, right? Like this yeah. is, this is where, like you're saying, 
there's a strong transition. And now, since we've hit this half point, there's been some things you've wanted to let's let's do a check in real quick. Yeah. There's been some things you've wanted to talk about more generally, like the portraits. Yeah. Um, so what do you? So what are your what are your thoughts by this point of the game? I am loving it by this point mm-hmm. because I feel like the portraits fit again just this eighties media so well uh all the characters right. look very accurate to me <laughs> yeah it feels it feels like i am in an interactive 80s movie almost and that's why i like the portraits so much they did away with them for their second game the devs did away with it for their second game in english haunting i think it makes sense because the portraits are almost cheesy they're very harvester cheesy-esque or even yeah. even later even like Gabriel Knight has portraits too. It, actually, they're pretty close to the Gabriel Knight portraits. They're a little more detailed, whereas you on the screen are just a pixelated, weird little guy. And then you have this <laughs> kind of more realistic, uh, almost uh, photographic, but not really type of portrait. I love it. I, I love yeah. that their expressions change. It gives the game a lot of, um, just a lot of a per- personality, a lot of character, you know? Right. I, I, there's something I like about pixel art and how like it makes everybody look, I don't know, like kind of cute. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You can like, you can like forget about features. Absolutely. Like humanistic features. And you can just be like, oh, look at that. Even like the bad guys. You're kind of like, oh, look at that cute little guy. Look at that cute little guy. (laughs) And when the portrait is there, it does diminish that somewhat. But yeah, I, I think they are very accurate. There's like, there's a there's a woman who ha- w- she tells you she was very inspired by the new Cindy Lauper video. Yeah, <laughs> and so she looks yeah. almost exactly like Cindy Lauper. It's great. Um, I really like those portraits. It gives it kind of almost again almost a B movie vibe. Um, I'm in the game. Not- You're in the game. Yeah, I'm the that there's that blonde, uh, shaggy haired actor that's at the beginning <laughs> of the game. Uh, Crosby, something Crosby. Yeah, no, I don't want to yeah. be Crosby actually. He's a dick. Yeah, he sucks, and he's, and a, he's a part and he's of a, a cult. Yeah, he's part of a cult. Um, and it gets even it's even better to me in Serena because you get all these kind of tropey characters. You know, um, the character that arrests you, he's a cop named Rick. And he's he's very very eighties cop looking, mm-hmm, almost kind of bumbly, mm-hmm. but pretty good at his job. And we kind of buddy up with him and work with him. You he's know, got like throughout. a fur lined brown police jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, and by the way, we're we're arrested falsely. I should put that in there, just because there's yeah. been weird things. There's been a disappearance in the town of a young girl, and so. He had to. Be, you're you're new. You showed up out of nowhere, right? So he put you yeah. in a jail cell right away. But you know, he checks you out, and then you're free to go, and you're free to, you know, dig around this insane town. Well, of he deputizes you. There's this, I guess, nuisance of a citizen of the town who has been complaining about witches and he's like i just need you to go check on this guy i just need you to go see what he's up to it's not going to be anything um yeah i hereby deputize you yeah um but then yeah then you go and you find out this guy who is afraid of witches his dog has been legitimately like mangled and bashed with a rock yeah um Sorry, people. Maybe we should have spoiler warned. I know how much people hate animal violence. Even it's upsetting. Pixelated yeah. with animal it's, violence. It is upsetting. I'm not going to lie. It's a go- It's a little, there is some gore in this game meant to, you know, replicate some of the slasher gore that you might see in one of those movies. Yeah, it could get a little intense, especially like, yeah, investigating the dog corpse was a little. That's pretty intense. Yeah, intense. I agree. Should we just like run down all the things that, so, because for the next, say, hour and a half of the game, it is very fetch questy. It is is very mm-hmm. like you gotta go to the you gotta get the bread from the dog bowl to give to the goose to get the, uh, to get the yeah what, what do you call, the fishing line to get the teddy bear to give to the woman yeah. to get the pills to give to the man. Like what it's do you very think about that? like what do you think about the puzzles? I, I'd say like the first half of 
the puzzles in Serena, I felt were very organic. It just felt like things were happening and I had to solve my way out of them. Yeah. But about the, it was about like the second half of Serena where, again, it felt very fetch questy. It felt like, okay, I know all the stuff I need to do. I just got to go travel to a bunch of different locations. And I know when I get there, there's going to be some other block. And nothing was yeah. challenging and nothing was... Um, Nothing was there was there's very little out of the box thinking. A lot of it was yeah. just bouncing around doing the thing the exact things people asked of you. Yeah. I did I did get a little like uh stuck very briefly, but other than that, I actually I really liked these puzzles, but you know me, I like fetch quests. This is exactly the kind of game <laughs> that I like. I like interrogating characters and seeing where it brings me. I actually thought the puzzle design was very strong. Uh, because it wasn't convoluted. You know what I mean? Right. It, the game had a great flow to it. Everything always felt like it was flowing. It wasn't slow paced. I always felt, you know, a sense of thrill on each screen. Um, even though very few jump scares, mostly just um, a sense of dread when you're in right. this town. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just this one section, um, and again, it's like the second half of you being in Serena before sort of like the end run of the game, where I didn't feel much challenge. I just felt like I was bouncing, like ping-ponging around. <laughs> um, sure. I, I could definitely see that. Um, I think I didn't feel it as much as you, because okay. I was so into it. I, that I just, I enjoyed, I would say, the majority of this game. I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy some of it, but it does go off. It does go off the rails uh, in the end section. So there is that. Right. And so this town of Serena, as you're going through, also you're uncovering, like, the dozens of horrible things that have happened in this town. So, like, maybe you can help me think of some of these. Uh, there well, was... The bi the bi Thing was it seemed like when uh, and keep in mind this is the last place that edward keller was seen he we find out from the locals that he wanted to film a, a movie there with like a little what 16 millimeter camera or something that yeah. he would just drag around and just film stuff and we come to learn that his uh, once he arrived things started going wrong and then one of the biggest things was an entire school burnt down and it was all fa there were only fatalities nobody survived so a lot of kids uh perished in this uh, fire I think, said, I think they said 80 maybe yeah uh so now there's like barely any children in this town and the children that were there one went missing 10 years ago and in the present there's one missing now and one went missing recently yeah there's a woman who clawed her own eyes out there's a there's a woman who hung herself off a bridge there is uh what what the woman with um, dementia that started acting up kind of after the – that they fled Serena because she was so traumatized by everything that happened. And everybody right. else is just a little strange. Uh, everything – everyone else is just a little weird. The guy that we have to go interrogate as as this kind of fake deputy, he's very strange. I would say everyone's also just very guarded mm -hmm. and paranoid. Because of this cursed, a cursed town oh, that they live there's in. There's the man who's living in the sewers eating rats. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he doesn't want to be on the surface. So he's basically losing his mind in the sewer. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just a, a town chock full of every disturbing idea you can think of. Uh, um, there's the man who, uh, in the house... Uh, what did he do? He, I, th I think it was one of those kind of classic horror stories of like he oh. murdered his family and, and and then himself, right? Yeah, I believe that's the case. That's the house yeah. that Edward Keller once is supposedly film like filmed his, you know, lost. Yeah, he was working. In. He was working out of there. Yeah, working out of there. Yeah. So now it's becoming, you know, kind of evident that we might find a film. Then at first it was a rumor. Yeah. But now the locals are kind of helping us to find this guy, uh, only to find out that we, <laughs> should we say? Yeah, sure. He's dead. <laughs> he died. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He died. He died uh, of, just like of cancer. Cancer. Right? Yeah. He died it's, of cancer. Nothing. 
big or supernatural about his death. Just, just he died. However, he is buried in Serena, which you would think is a bad idea because it seems like since he's been in this town, nothing but bad things have been happening. But he is uh, very particular about where he wants to be buried. That's true. Yeah, that is and true. He, yeah, it does come to light that he. Much like kind of much like a, a Charles Manson type is controlling people into doing really horrible things so that he can film it, film them. Right. Um, so with assistance, you know, and you can kind of speculate this in the game that that's what's happening because the game foreshadows Edward Keller being a terrible, almost evil human being, you know, throughout. And that's why nobody wants anything to do with him back in LA. Right. Um, so we come to find out that through various people he was using, he is responsible for these bad things. Why? So he can film them, which is uh, uh, so messed up. I can't even fathom what a, what a mm-hmm. messed up concept, right? We see a film of him that he, he filmed himself talking about his process. And he's also just like trying to conjure up some sort of paranormal <laughs> What, like, the bad things that are happening in the town, he's trying to build a, a what would you call this? Like a spell? Is he casting a yes. spell? Yeah, they call it, I think, like an incantation. So okay. the, 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 what he's trying to do, so he wants to take horror to the next level. He's got a big ego on him. And he wants to take horror to the next level. He wants something so frightening that it will send your brain to hell itself. So he's trying to make this incantation, almost this curse. Let's call it a curse, you know, Right. that he's putting on this film, uh, which is why he's filming real things, presumably, that when you when you watch it, something horrible is going to happen to you. Which, man, it gets so intense uh, at the end. It becomes it becomes a very grim, very dark story at the end. Yeah. It, almost, it almost changes genres from, like, you're kind of working around slasher-type things and myths and urban legends about slashers to, like, this very dark, uh, I don't want to say, well, maybe a little psychological as well, but very almost William Peter Blatty, uh, who wrote The Exorcist, uh just very dark very dark and it's very supernatural like as you're in the town of serena is when supernatural things kind of start happening yeah um you start seeing ghosts and unexplained phenomena and then yeah the end kind of like kathy rain the game kathy rain yes um the very end you are just sort of transported into a different world (laughs) you know you were just kind of outside of every grounded thing that you've experienced in the game and now in a whole new reality yeah it's again it's very structurally to me like gabriel knight you know you're doing investigations you're kind of starting to see stuff and then you're somewhere else completely and there is magic happening not magic supernatural we'll call it because magic implies that it's fun (laughs) but this is not fun also sort of the Indiana Jones format, right? Like, yes, yes. Yeah, is it is it Very supernatural? Much. Is it is it not? And then at the end it's like, oh yeah, it definitely is. Um Man, it gets so intense at the end. I I was yeah. I was actually kind of shocked that it managed to ramp up because I was feeling it in Serena. I was feeling like I said you start seeing supernatural things, it starts to become very tense and very spooky. Uh but it really ramps at the end and yeah like i said it gets very grim i don't really want to spoil the end sure um because i think it's some of it is so shocking and interesting that i kind of want to keep that uh for the for the player absolutely but i I will say it does go dark right so how did you feel about the ending then i really liked it i really like how dark it went this game was very unashamed of giving us a very harrowing experience um (laughs) i I will say this too the very ending it's a good ending it's not this is not an ending where you're gonna like want to throw shit at your computer screen Uh, it is not a hobbs barrow okay Mm -hmm. the end is worth getting to but yeah keep in mind it goes into stories of people's evil doing and 
fears um, and how fear, I think, can warp your brain or, or send you somewhere else. It's, it's very effective. It's honestly mm-hmm. very, very, very effective, it's just effective starting from the theater scene, I'll call it. And if you know, you know. Uh, <laughs> from that point on, I was, right. I think, pretty terrified of moving around my new environment, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was kind of scared in Serena, uh, but that managed to be more subdued than our end, than the end game, we'll call it. Yeah, I, I mean, how much are, how informed are you of this era of, film of this era of horror and pretty informed um okay yeah i like horror as a genre i've seen most of the classic slashers um i love the 80s a lot so <laughs> uh pretty pretty informed i think that's why i liked it so much i just felt yeah. i felt the game did a good job putting me in this setting and making me feel like this is a character that could have existed this is a genre that did exist and you know, these are the things that the youth were excited about. And <laughs> right. And then getting into the the paranormal stuff, which again, that kind of that reminded me more of um some of the, the cults from like the sixties. Talking about it, it makes it <laughs> seem like it's not cohesive. It makes it seem like we're bouncing all over. But it I think it really does have a good flow of how it takes Definitely. you through this story. Yeah. It it does not feel disjointed at all. These big transitions that we're talking about feel earned. Yeah, it doesn't feel like two different stories. It feels like one continuous yeah. story. Um, is there anything, knowing about that era, is there anything that you think people would just completely miss if they didn't? Or do you think it's just all baked into the game? I think that you will do fine but not at the 80s arcade quiz game. Like if you're really uninformed, (laughs) you're not going to do well at that game. But because the game, I think because the game relies on the bigger things that were popular at the time, like the Freddy Krueger movies and some of the, and Elvira and stuff like that. These are pop culture names. The game is very smart in that it's not trying to pander to people who only want deep cuts. You know what I mean? Like deep cut films and obscure things it's it it leads us to that in the story right we're looking for an obscure thing but Mm -hmm. i think if you are of our generation and and, and younger too um if you just like horror in general the game is pretty accessible and even if you don't like it it you know the vibe the aesthetic the game's not the puzzles don't rely on that the puzzles are grounded um, right are there Are there references you felt like that deepened your experience? Like you were like, oh, I know who this producer is supposed to be modeled after. Yeah, or... yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm-hmm. like even just, you know, even just the comparison to Heaven's Gate and some of the more realistic stuff. Sure. And granted, these are very terrible things that the game is referencing, but it does it does make it feel real, I guess. The, the game yeah. makes it feel like these are real happenstances and yeah the game name drops specific producers and maybe it's a little pandery i still think it's accessible in that way you know but yeah it just it's very smart the way it does it and yeah i think the references were just enough there's just enough real people reference and then every and then the main the main story right the edward keller story is fictionalized so i think it all you know joined together very well yeah, I don't actually think it's pandery. I think it is. Uh, I think it's just clear that um, this dev has a passion for this era and did a lot of research and yeah, folded that know. research into the game, right? Like, instead mm-hmm. of directly referencing, like, they're clearly um, characters that are supposed to me- represent multiple figures from that era. Um, yeah. And again, like, f- the idea of all these different legends of this one of these classic eras of Hollywood, right? Like this, maybe this is the seediest era of Hollywood, right? Um, yeah. And then and then warping sort of again, like the idea of the Kingmaker, the idea of the uh, 
the lost film and the snuff film and like all these again all these legends of this era of hollywood um sort of wrapping them all up into one cohesive story um oh there's one other thing we didn't talk about which is fun uh and i wonder if you turned it off or not um there is a thing where anytime you travel when you're in Hollywood, the taxi drivers talk to you. Yeah, they talk to you. And they like remember <laughs> you and pick up conversations where they left off and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and it yeah, says so about this, I'm like, uh <laughs> It says early on, it's like, um, you can turn this off and <laughs> Yeah, you can like turn this off. I never did. I never turned it off. Me neither. It did annoy me and I didn't turn it off. And I did not <laughs> turn it off. Like, yeah. yeah. It's it's a very yeah they put that mechanic in there they put the uh, dagger of Amon Ro taxi cab mechanic in there so when you're in LA the way you travel is via taxi and you get in there yeah. and they try to talk to you but it's not like Zach McCracken or something where you have to uh, manage your money you just have unlimited right. well you have money that is limited by yeah. whatever you need in the scenario right <laughs> like if it's like yeah. you know. It's like if more need... realistic that way. It's like, yeah, of course mm-hmm. I have a wallet and of course I have some money. Like, why yeah, wouldn't I yeah. have, you know what I mean? Unless something oh, yeah. horrible has happened. But in, as a screenwriter in LA, right? Yeah, you're not going to have to search for money. So thank you, game, for being realistic with that. Which is opposed to an English haunting. Which, right. uh, yep. do you have anything left to say about Nightmare Frames? Or are we re- ready to move on to our next game? I am ready to move on to English Haunting, but I, I just want to reiterate, guys, uh-huh. I I really loved this game. I really did. It's, I would play it again. It's really good. I yes. don't know that I hold it s- this so much higher over an English Haunting like you do, but yeah. I I am I was very impressed with this game. Um, I played it maybe a year ago, and mm-hmm. I replayed it for this episode, and it was just. You know, it's like uh, it's like playing Sam and Max or something, right? Yeah, like I just, yeah. It just pulled me through everything. I was like, oh, I kind of, I don't remember every step of the way as much right. as I do with Sam and Max, but it was like every moment was just like, uh, I wasn't like, ugh, I got to go through this part to get to the good part. Same. Every moment I was like, I like this. I am, yeah. I am having fun. Again, just the vibe alone, it put me somewhere mm-hmm. else. I really, I was really feeling it. And yeah, I do hold it higher than an English haunting, but that's, but I think that only, that only really says how high I hold it because I hold English haunting pretty high too. So yeah, uh, yeah we're yeah. going to have to discuss why and where I felt the discrepancies were with that. So should I, do you have anything more to say about Nightmare Frames? No, I think that's it. Anything else that I have to say is more in comparison with English Haunting. So, uh, yeah, please go play it, you guys, especially if you're one of, you know, one of my fans that watches for the horror stuff as well. Mm -hmm. I think you really will appreciate the vibes. All right, let's play a Hollywood Pacino and then Hollywood Pacino. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my favorite movie. Hi, Matt. Hey. We're back. We're back. How's, How's your break? break? Oh, How's jinx. Break? <laughs> uh, now I can't talk for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's just me, guys. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'll just pretend was... like you're still there, though. My break was good. Uh, we actually both took our breaks this time. Which yeah, is which is rare. Oftentimes we just sit here talking and then say we were on a break. Yeah. It's all um, lies. It's lies. We're taking you behind the uh, the kayfabe here or whatever. Um, yeah, how was yours? It's good. I got a cherry limeade, and thus I am ready to talk about an English haunting. Oh, you know what happened during my break? So what? I I went to the bathroom and heard my guinea pigs just like whistling up a storm upstairs. Aww. I have two. Aww. I have two guinea pigs, Fern and Fiona. Those are Adventure Time names. Um, and they're really upset that I started recording today before I fed them their dinner oh, of no. peppers and lettuce. <laughs> so, How dare you? Yeah, they're starving to death. <laughs> they're not, they might not make it through. 
<laughs> yeah, Basket followed me in here because she can't not be oh she heard me say her name no go back to sleep uh she can't <laughs> not be where i am so she is in her little pink bed sleeping next to me as i record uh one of the funniest things about guinea pigs is that they're constantly eating or sleeping but by sleeping like they don't close their eyes so they're just laying down um <laughs> or eating so even like I haven't brought up their peppers and lettuce, and they're so furious. They have a whole bowl <laughs> of pellets. So they have a whole like a uh, little container of hay. They there's never a time they don't have food, and they're still Your needs are so, met. <laughs> they're still so mad. <laughs> Routine, you know. Have you mm-hmm. seen those um short little videos on Instagram or TikTok where? This woman is a piano player and she, her guinea pig, like loves to sleep on the piano and just listen. Oh, I have to show. It's so cute. It is so cute. I'll have to show you after. Please share that with me. Yeah. But anyway, yes, guinea pigs. Uh, Also, English Haunting. And English Haunting is a game about two guinea pigs. (laughs) (laughs) That believe in ghosts. So this is a uh, this is another postmodern adventures game, also by uh, Jose Maria Melendez. As much as Nightmare Frames is like this in- immaculately researched, comp- like very clearly passion based uh, setting of nineteen eighty five Hollywood, this is turn of the century England um, in the Spiritism movement. Yes. Um, which is distinct from the spiritualism movement of like modern day, <laughs> right? With like, correct, yes, <laughs> correct. Yeah, with, with like uh, rocks that speak to people or whatever. Um, this is the spiritism <laughs> movement of there's ghosts and they can talk through our bodies and stuff. So mediums are very uh, are very prolific in this time. Mediums, ec- ectoplasm, um, yeah the the fox sisters who would knock on the table or no yep. they had well they had extra joints in their toes right oh oh what yeah they had extra joints in their toe i believe and uh so this is the fox sisters and they would pretend that ghosts were talking through knocks and no one could yeah. ever figure out how they did it they're like you're, you're not they're not doing it with their hands they're not and it was just they had this joint in their toe that made their toes oh my slam God. on the ground yeah Wonderful. <laughs> That's what um, this game's about. No. Um, yeah, and it, it this game involves a lot of the real figures from that era, including the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is Aleister Crowley's um, mm. cult. Uh, you know, Aleister Crowley, famously uh, famous oh, evil magician <laughs> man. Yeah. <laughs> You play a professor. I, I don't. I don't remember his discipline, but he is. Um. Yeah. He, I mean, he's he's in charge of the metaphysics department. Yeah, that's that's not his discipline in the college, but is it like he is English. Yeah, it's something I, normal. Yeah, it's <laughs> something, then, something very normal. He's also part of the mes- metaphysics department with. Um, his partner, Professor Nelson Ward, who again teaches something normal, but is part of the metaphysics department, um, which uh, is funded to look into like spiritual metaphysical matters. Yeah. Um, what we find out is that Nelson Ward has gone missing, has absconded with thousands of dollars that were donated to the college. And now the college wants to shut down the metaphysics department. And so you, as Patrick Moore, have 72 hours to prove that ghosts exist or the metaphysics department gets shut down. So now you have two mysteries. Number one, you have to see what the fuck happened to Nelson Ward. Number two, you have to prove that ghosts exist in an impossibly short amount of time. From there, you sort of just like take off on your mystery. And I found right away in comparison to Nightmare Nightmare Frames that this game is way more subdued. Don't get me yeah. wrong, it still has that structure where it's going to go off at some point. It's called an English haunting. 
we're gonna find ghosts that that's implied <laughs> yeah. it's implied everywhere right otherwise yeah. why are we playing this game why are we going <laughs> right, into this right. story can you imagine there's no <laughs> ghosts in this game right no of, co- of course that's implied but it is a little more subdued in nature and that could be just because of the time you know that it's set in uh regardless of that i i liked the puzzle structure of this one and i liked all the all the characters that we end up talking to, they did do away with portraits. And I wonder if that's because the portraits in nightmare frames, they looked eighties esque. I don't think that the game would, I don't think an English haunting would benefit from that extra aesthetic. You know what I mean? I think it's fine on its own. Well, also I, yeah, I wonder if those take longer. I wonder if those were drawn by a different artist than, than jose uh, melendez you know I, I i don't know um and that like that he couldn't get back for this game but i really i really like the art like it is very similar to nightmare frames and the way that nightmare frames really brings out the feel of 1980s hollywood this really brings out the feel of uh turn of the century london right which just inherently i think is gonna feel a little more drab i mean think about it the 80s versus early 1900s london not great you know it it is what it is and this is you mentioned that it's subdued it still has the same impeccable writing that nightmare frames does i don't know if we talked about that much in nightmare frames but the dialogue is amazing uh incredibly well written i also have to say (laughs) Um, my editor at Adventure Game Hotspot, I noticed this in the credits, Mm -hmm. was the, uh, English, like, translate, like, proofreader. Oh, cool. The the English translation. So, like, you know, uh, that, I don't know, uh, good work, Jack. (laughs) Jack Allen of um, Adventure Game Hotspot. Shout out. yeah uh but the the writing's impeccable and it's very much styled after english gothic horror literature which Mm -hmm. was a lot more subdued right which had a lot slower of a build-up which really took its time to set its characters and its setting uh really took its time to ground things in reality so that when the supernatural stuff started happening um it really had a strong impact uh, yeah. If you think about writers like Algernon Blackwood or um, writers like the writers that are all like name checked in, yeah. in, yeah. in this game, like M.R. James or uh, even, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. Poe. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's even it's funny. They make a reference at one point. You're in a horror bookshop and it's just packed full of. Uh, references to gothic horror <laughs> literature yeah and, um, and it's there for no other purpose that is yes. pandering and i like you, it <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah the guy even uh can sub- you, he subjects you to a quiz and you're like well what do i get if i win the quiz and he's like an achievement you're like what's an achievement and he's like i don't know it's an achievement <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, and so you you get to take it as many times as you want, but it's like a quiz Funny. about gothic horror. Um, uh, and at one point, you can answer one of the questions. You can answer H.P. Lovecraft, who wasn't around yet. And the guy's mm. like, what? No, what? Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I didn't catch that. It's very funny. Um but Lovecraft is another example of this, right? Setting a really like solid baseline of reality for a long time mm-hmm. so that when the supernatural twist happens, you're like, oh my God, and it really hits you in the stomach. Yeah. In that way, I, ha- I found while playing this that this, is ver- this structure and this storyline and even the characters and the things that happen, it, it's not a one-to-one, obviously, but it's so similar to gabriel knight it's not stealing it you guys if <laughs> it's but it's very influenced by and it it's 
I really like it uh, because Gabriel Knight, I thought, was a well-written a well written game. So if you're going to be mm-hmm. influenced by something, that's a good thing to be influenced you by. You steal but, from the best, yeah. Yeah, you, you take from the best. But I, I want to make it clear how, how very close it is. Uh, the music being the first thing I clocked immediately. Um, mm-hmm. The structure being the way you travel is you get a map and you unlock things as your map different places and these places are all you know compartmentalized they're shops and they're on a they're, stores. they're on a map of the city they're just map like the circles city, yep. uh that are icons on a map of the city just like gabriel knight yeah. yeah just like gabriel knight the way characters play their roles in the game is very a uh, similar the fact that we're dealing with something supernatural uh Actually, and and actually, we deal with um, mediums in this game. Some of which are yeah. frauds, and we kind of, you know, we figure that out. Versus Gabriel Knight, where we're talking about Marie Laveau, who was uh, a known. What did they call? What did they call Marie? Shoot, what did they call well, her? Well, fraud is a part of voodoo. <laughs> it is a part of the voodoo tradition. Oh, she was a voodoo priestess. Um, there we go. She was a priestess. Yes. Uh, um, even if even those who believe in Marie Laveau's powers also believe uh, her to have, you know, defrauded, especially people outside the faith. Yeah. Um, but there's just all just, these yeah. there's just all of these correlations, including the way that characters die in the game, because this is a, this is a, a mystery for the most part. Um, and there is going to be death scenes very it's very much like gabriel knight and there's somebody who sacrifices themselves an older person that sacrifices themselves just like in gabriel knight just like your (laughs) uncle wolfgang crazy crazy comparisons uh for me uh but that's a good thing um i would say that gabriel knight goes off the rails a little bit more and it's it it (laughs) maybe held my attention more because that game is set in new orleans maybe there's more stimuli again this is set in early 1907 london so all the screens are very drab it's very setting appropriate right i did really like this game but i I don't know how you feel but i felt like i was waiting kind of a while for things to ramp up I i was waiting for a flow and the things that did ramp up, I felt like were a little disjointed, which is the opposite of Nightmare Frames. We talked about that and we said that was very organic. Yeah. Uh, in an English haunting, I felt like the stakes weren't as high. Uh, right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It felt a little, to me, it felt a little more disjointed. I, I understand. I do think, I, I agree with you. I think that... Um, unlike all of its clear influences right like unlike um these gothic horror stories which have just like a usually a very very tight twist right like the twist is so um uh it it, it sort of almost like throws a blanket over (laughs) over the rest of the story and you're like um you're sort of like, oh my god, this this like changes the context of everything that I've seen so far. That didn't yeah. really happen in this game, um, yeah. And it felt a little more like a maybe 1990s Hollywood movie when it hit its sort of denouement, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, than a gothic horror story, right? Um, yeah. It it felt like. It almost, yeah, felt like it was building to, like, an exciting third act, like in an action or a thriller, rather than a serious mind-bending um, twist, or even or even inevitable-feeling twist, like a gothic horror. Um, yeah. That said, I, I really did enjoy this game. I enjoyed every moment of this game. Um, I really... I, I think the writing was so strong. Writing is even, very strong. Yeah. Even if there are boring parts, I was so happy to read them. Yeah. Um, and one of the ways that it grounds the story and just to sort of jump back towards the, the, the first half, right. Um, one of the ways that it grounds the story is you, Patrick Moore are 
you believe in ghosts, you believe in the supernatural, but you're also a very skeptical guy. Mm-hmm. You um basically uh there's a the BASS, the British Association of uh, we I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, spiritual... I'm, I'm gonna guess it's spirituality or science or something something like that yeah um this society you have recently written a paper much like um alan goldberg recently wrote uh had an interview where he trashed all of <laughs> um like uh yeah he trashed uh he trashed, and he El- trashed yeah yeah the elvira pastiche um yeah eliza you recently trashed BASS in um, a paper. Yeah. And in an essay. And you also, you understand that uh, these, a lot of these mediums that you're seeing, you go in sort of like, I know these are frauds. Even a character that you work very closely with, like one of the first yeah. conversations with you have with her, you're like, I know you're a fraud. And she's like, yeah, I'm a fraud. Um, yeah. Which is also really interesting because she's like, yeah, I'm a fraud because I was a metaphysical researcher like you, but no one took me seriously in the scientific fields. So instead, I decided to just defraud people. So this game, especially, so in this first half, you're basically bouncing around London and you are following leads as to what could have happened to Nelson Ward at the same time, sort of keeping your eye open for places where real paranormal activity might be occurring um yeah. that's very that's a distant second to finding your buddy nelson ward professor yeah. ward um and a lot of the characters that you run into are like real figures from yeah. hi- the history of spiritism and the history of london um you meet for example uh i don't know if the gangster like patty Oh, those guys. Yeah. I don't know if those are real, but while you are interacting with them, they reference other real London gang leaders, like yeah. the Bowery Boys and like Larry Foley, the boxing the boxing yeah. gangster, the Catholic boxer. Um <laughs> they also also you run into Florence Cook. Yeah. Who was a real medium. And they put her real her kind of real story in there as well. It's clear that this guy did his research. They put her act in the game. Um, And uh, 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 Harry Houdini also appears. Why you may ask, Uh, because at that time later in life, Harry Houdini was so upset that there were so many frauds that he spent the end of his life uh, yelling at them. (laughs) Yeah. trying to prove them as frauds yeah yeah he was like yeah he was a, a famous skeptic and there's even a joke about how she's gonna punch him in the stomach which yeah yeah of was course. a little tasteless because that's how he died i don't know did he actually die from a punch to the stomach or was it something else i just feel i just feel like you can't like die yeah yeah he died from a uh, swelling of the abdomen Related mm-hmm. to appendicitis and possibly related to the punch of his stomach he received about a week and a half earlier. So, like, when oh, we talk about so Houdini, it wasn't... right? Yeah. Th- this is kind of where I, what I thought it was. When we talk about his, him being punched, he didn't just die, like, at being punched, right? He right. had, like, something wrong with him. <laughs> and then he got punched. <laughs> and then, yeah, there you go. That's what I mean, happened. I knew he didn't die on stage, but I assumed right. it was like that night. Um, yeah, yeah. But then again, if your act is, hey, everybody come up and punch me in the stomach, and then you Ooh. die of appendicitis, I'm yeah. going to say the two are probably linked. Yeah, they're possibly related, but like he did, there was like something wrong. Mm-hmm. And then he didn't um, help himself by asking to be punched in the stomach. Yeah. Maybe but, don't so, do that. Florence. <laughs> Florence Cook is in the game, and you help, by trickery, reunite her with uh, Sir William Crooks, who was famous for having vouched for Florence Cook. um, And nobody quite knew why, because he was a very serious scientist. He's the guy who discovered the element thallium. Yep, yep. Um, And 
you he was also like a like a spiritist guy um yeah was he yeah um and you are in this game you reunite the two which is kind of sweet if you know the history yeah. of those characters in in history but some of this gets a little absurd unfortunately yeah it's, I, I agree. It's, it is very cool to be solving this mystery of nelson ward but towards the end of this first act which is all about yeah where did nelson ward go you have and this is a person who was involved in this movement at the time um he was also a member of the order the hermetic order of the golden dawn which is again alistair crowley's mm -hmm. um organization in, yeah yeah this is the writer of sherlock holmes arthur conan doyle <sighs> um i i wasn't look i wasn't mad when arthur conan doyle showed up it, it they already had houdini show up it's not like it doesn't make sense for the time that's fine but it felt like a joke right when yeah, he walks did. in and he's like hi i am famous author arthur conan doyle you're like yeah really yeah no it felt a little strange and I, I it's it's too bad because i think the dev does a good job bringing historical yeah. things into the game again much like jane jensen does with her gabriel knight series she brings sure. historical real real stories and history to those games and research right. and myth and this dev does a good job too i just don't like it when it's brought literally into the game and yeah you meet sir arthur conan doyle and then later you play as him yeah so this is just like nightmare frames has a kind of a two act structure yes um this game has the same so <laughs> well I, I guess three act but the third act in in both games is very short yeah and, and very similar it kind of like it, the structure is very clear to me it's like act one act two goes off the rails <laughs> act, like, act one is an investigation act yes. two is things get a little crazy get a little weird and yeah act three things go completely unhinged yes um, correct and yeah so this this transition from act one to act two so you you don't discover what happened to nelson ward yet but you you're, you're getting closer and closer and you also figure out a project he was working on that would bring the spiritual realm to our world um, yeah. they would bring the two closer together so you could you know record spirits yeah right? In yes a a supernatural way. circumstances yeah yeah um and it's interesting too it, it sort of evo involves ectoplasm which is a phenomenon from the time and it involves corpse photography which is a yeah. which was a cultural trend at the time very very interesting historical stuff but then yeah you you're kind of in his lab and arthur conan doyle walks in he's like hey i saw the light was on and i thought i'd stop in i'm arthur yeah. conan doyle the <laughs> writer of sherlock holmes <laughs> um and then the second act you are so arthur conan doyle decides to go off and find nelson ward because he thinks yeah, they're he... friends apparently friends and yeah. colleagues and stuff yeah and he thinks i can, he's like i can find him um, yeah which spoiler alert he does but uh then you uh as patrick moore you kind of go off looking for the next I ingredient <laughs> to this special machine that ward was working yeah. on yeah what did you think of the the scottish town of eriswell which is not real by the way yeah um <laughs> what a strange section of the game i just yeah. want to say so earlier i mentioned it felt like the stakes were a little low uh there are points in this game that eriswell being one of them where something scary is going to happen something weird is going yeah. on right um and that's where you find the cult you find the cult on this island and it's definitely a, a point of the game where it's very serious and people die. But it, it it feels to me like it goes so fast. And the way it was handled at the end of that chapter, I'm like, oh, okay. It, it felt like the character wasn't particularly moved by anything <laughs> that happened. Yeah, like his friends die and he's kind of just yeah. like, 
Like people like, die, oh, that's, man. That sucked. <laughs> yeah. And and you you go to report it, and because of the time, because of the time this was set in, there's like no proof. And the Scottish police are just like, you just better leave. Just get out of here. It's like, what? Did you th- God, the stakes are low. <laughs> you know, I, I so thought the Scottish police were in on it. Oh, okay. um, could be. Until then they cut to kind of like a scene right after you leave. And yeah. both of them are just like, oh, that guy's crazy, huh? And it's like, oh, oh man. Oh, yeah. They probably <laughs> you barely a- believed him. Yeah. You missed a trick here. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I think it might have been better if they were like, yeah, if like. It- they walked into another room and put their and you saw like yes. a glimpse of their like cult robe. That would have that would have I think tied it together a little bit more and made it seem a little more urgent because when you're playing this part, it things are pretty urgent. Okay, yeah. it goes off, but then that urgency is is kind of taken away. And I, I don't I want to make this very clear. I really liked this game. I am mm-hmm. just I, I I wish it had had more details like that. Like maybe the the police were in on it, and that would have rose, yeah. you know, risen those stakes just a little bit higher, so that nothing felt um, like dismissed. Like I said, Patrick wasn't particularly moved by anything that happened. He wasn't. I would be traumatized mm-hmm. if I came across a cult that's trying to kill me, and I don't know where my <laughs> friend is. My friend's missing. You know what I, I mean? So. I, I will I will say though one of the things that we are led to um, understand about Patrick from the very beginning of the game is that he is a very dispassionate man. He is a man yeah. who is m- driven, but um, views the world very rationally and very scientifically. Um, so it makes and when we meet finally meet Nelson Ward, it's clear that he is. Um, they make it very clear he's on the spectrum, right? Like he talks about not understanding human cues, like yeah. uh, social cues. He makes it clear he there are certain human emotions that he cannot relate to, so that yeah. he needs people to tell him about them. Yeah, um, and he's your best friend, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you you are playing somebody who is a little divorced from uh, his emotional side. Sure. Yeah. For sure. But yeah. So while you're off finding this artifact and this cult and uh whatever um at this so you cut back to sir arthur conan doyle who is looking for nelson ward and you play sherlock (laughs) author arthur conan doyle yeah and you're using like methods of deduction and like figuring out stuff like look i didn't hate it i didn't hate it no I just felt, and obviously games like this, especially indie games that are well written like this, these are passion projects. So I get it. It this dev's passions and interests they are on full display, and there's yeah. something I really respect about that. Uh, that but being any said, editor that... <laughs> would have been like, "Hey, cut! Why don't this shouldn't be?" <laughs> yeah. I think that's why maybe it felt a little more disjointed. I I wasn't yeah. expecting it. Um and and I and what's really interesting is I love that was my favorite setting of the game. Same. Uh I le- I love a good old haunted asylum moment, truly. Um Yeah, the asylum scene was really it okay, that was just a really fun adventure game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to you have to break into an asylum to free Nelson. Nelson Ward has been set up by sort of a conspiracy. You also yeah. find out that the money that he stole was his, um, not the. Right. You start to it starts to unravel. That there's a there is a conspiracy happening here, um, against the metaphysics department and against Nelson Ward, and you're unraveling that as you're finding him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's like a lot of cool little puzzles about like you having to trick everybody in the asylum so that you can get to Nelson Ward and free him. It's yeah. Pretty rad. (laughs) (laughs) No, I did like, that was my favorite setting. Uh, But again, it did feel like a separate. Yeah. Is what, what am I playing sanitarium at this point, which is also a very disjointed game. So maybe that's a good comparison, but But (laughs) 
But the puzzles in it reminded me of Gabriel Knight or one of the like uh, the David Gilbert. Ga- what? Oh God, what's his like unavowed? Name? Yeah, or like the Blackwell games. Oh, Blackwell game. Yeah, yeah. It it reminded me of why can't I think of <laughs> that company's name? It's so oh the Watcher Eye. Yeah. The Wadget Eye, yeah. It reminded me of like Wadget Eye Games puzzles. Um, yeah. Th- some of the better ones. I I really, really liked that sequence. I did too. And and for the most part, I found, well, once again, I really found the puzzle design really good. Uh, it yeah. flowed. It has, it has this linear, na- both games, I think, have this linear nature where you never feel like you don't quite know what to do. You know what you're doing. You know what your next goal is, you know? Or... Yeah, or yes, you always know what your goal is. And as far as puzzle solutions, even if you don't, if they don't r- readily occur to you, you're at least like, I know where to look. Yeah. I know where to start looking for for the, for any hints as to how to solve this puzzle. Like, yeah. I, I remember, you know, I would uncover a detail and they'd be like, oh, I know where to find that thing. Yeah, yes. Uh, and then it's just like a matter of how do I get it? In, in that way, I think these games are designed very, very well. And it's still an adventure game, so you're always going to have a puzzle that you don't like. There's always going to be a clunker because it's hard to it's hard to think about what the player might be thinking about. Obviously, you can have quality control and, and all that kind of stuff. But in the end, it, it's difficult. Uh, yeah. But that being said, I think these puzzles are, are pretty good. And I, I think it's designed really well. I was actually very impressed by the design as a whole. Yeah. Uh, now, with the caveat that we loved this game and we loved the puzzles in this game, what was the biggest clunker for you? Hmm. In an in, in both puzzles. games or in an English haunting? In an English haunting. Oh man, I know there was one. Uh, I don't. I, I honestly, I don't remember what the biggest clunker was, but I I do know that I. I do know wh- which setting. Oh, you know what? I was struggling with the uh, the boxing guy. I was a little bit, not not when you meet him, but I was struggling to yeah. meet him. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot find, I could not find. So there's a, yeah. Okay. There's a point. Um, I'll mention my two clunkers and then I want to discuss what you just mentioned. Um, yeah. My two clunkers are, number one, you get a match. We talked about this last episode. You get a matchbook. It falls in water. You have to find a radiator to dry the match on. I like, got that come pretty quickly. On. No, it's I not, got, I mean. <laughs> I solved it quickly. Yeah. But my, my problem with it was, wouldn't you just, it would just dry if you're either, <laughs> it would dissolve in the, in the water. Yeah. Or it would dry after like a minute. Like, come yeah, on. I, I feel like that was put in there for strategically comedic purposes about how adventure games, for whatever reason, were always like dropping our matchbook <laughs> and, and they get wet and don't dry. Yeah. Like specifically Hugo's House of Horrors does that. You can drop your matches in a in a river. So yeah, I think that, I really do think that that was for comedic effect. I hope that's why. Um, Then the other puzzle that I didn't love was that when you first start playing Arthur Conan Doyle, you're looking for um, the dean of the college, and you just have to ask every student that walks past. Oh, you do? Um, And so you ask like one or two students, and they say like, I don't know where he is, I don't know where he is, and then you're like, oh, there must be another solution. So you try to leave the screen, and it's like... um, and it's like, oh, I should still find the dean of students. You're like, well, there's nothing else to click on here. There's two doors that I'm not allowed to go in. And so you click on some of the people walking past again, and they're like, you already talked to me. Uh, I don't know where the dean is. And you're like, this well, is then amazing. what the fuck? And then there's one random like guy you click on uh-huh. that's like, oh, I know where the dean is. And then the I clicked on him first, up. Matt. <laughs> Amazing. I didn't even know. I literally clicked Holy on that cow. guy first. So I'm That's like, oh, so cool. Wild. I just had to talk to a student. And yeah, first thing I did, I talked to this random student. He's like, I don't know where he is. But then he's like, oh, he's coming up right behind you. I'm like, cool. That didn't take long at all. Unbelievable. To to yeah, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. okay. That's all amazing. Right. So <laughs> then the other. Uh, so, okay. So then back to what you were talking about. Um, mm-hmm. 
the uh the boxing, the boxer puzzle. Guy. I so, think because it took me a while to there was something like went off in my brain where I missed a part of a dialogue where you can get marbles from a little kid. And I was having trouble oh, progressing okay. from there because I just couldn't I just didn't know what I needed. I I know I needed a certain type of flower to give to like this box, right? And I knew where to get it. Why didn't did you quite know that? Know to get the flower. Why did I get the flowers? How did you know that he needed a flower? Um, somebody told me that he needed like violets. Oh, I must have somebody missed that me. because here's what bothered me. I did not have trouble um, finding the marbles and getting the flowers. Yeah. I had trouble with, I was told that he was missing his lucky charm and yeah. I had no like even okay. vague hint that his lucky charm was a flower. So I was oh, just okay. trying every inventory item on. Yeah. This just kind of proves that the dialogue, if you do miss some dialogue, it will affect how you, what you know about the puzzles, because I found that out by going to the newspaper boy and asking him about sports. And he told me what the lucky charm was. He said they were violets. Oh so, my God. Versus that, me. Yeah. Versus me missing some of the dialogue. That with is that a kid very, on the dock. That's a very good puzzle clue. Yeah. I didn't not pay attention when he was talking about sports. I was like, oh, he's just mentioning one punch jack or whatever. One round yeah, jack. Yeah. And I did not pay attention to the rest of it. Wow. That is okay. Yeah. It's definitely one of those games where you, you do want to exhaust the dialogue options because new options might pop up again, just like Gabriel Knight interrogation and, and talking to characters is pretty important. Mm. I also should have realized because this is an this is a long standing adventure game thing. If if a dialogue option is repeatable, it is a clue to a puzzle. Oh, good if, good good observation there. If you if you talk to somebody about something and then that dialogue option disappears, it was just background yeah. or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Or it triggered something maybe. If you talk to somebody and the dialogue option remains and you can ask them about it again and they repeat the exact same thing again. Yeah. It's probably a clue to a puzzle because the dev wants you to have it, even if you missed it. Yeah. So back to where Arthur Conan Doyle, again, we find <laughs> Nelson Ward, we uncover the conspiracy. Uh, and now we go to the third act, which is we turn this we now have reunited Patrick Moore and Nelson Ward and we turn on this machine and we won't spoil the ending just like we didn't with um, Nightmare Frames. But yeah, I mean, a big paranormal mess happens. Yeah, the finale is pretty great. It, that was the that was the ramp up that I was yeah. very much wanting uh, and it did. But I guess like, I guess my my critique and it's it's really again these critiques sound like i don't like the game which i do but these critiques are a little more minor mm -hmm. it's just that i wish it i wish the ramp up was more i wish it flowed better because to me again some of the stakes felt really low patrick again patrick was kind of divorced from all these emotions so the drama for me didn't happen until that third act so it was like i'm doing this i'm doing this fetch quests okay and then, whoa, off the rails. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. There, there are spooky moments prior to that as well, and they're very effective. Um, there's a few that stand out to me for, for being pleasantly shocking and felt like it was good for the story. But yeah, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, but yeah, it goes off. I was really a big fan of that final act. I mean, I was a big fan yeah. of this whole game. I really like... Yeah. I really like gothic horror. I'm already a fan of H.P. Lovecraft, except for the racism, <laughs> and Algernon Blackwood, <laughs> yeah. and H.G. Uh, Wells, except for the racism, and sure. Edgar, Ed Edgar Allan Poe. Like, I'm already a big fan of gothic horror. So yeah. this was a treat for me. Um, this yeah. final act, though, was really exciting and actually kind of similar to the final act of Nightmare Frames. Yeah. Very, very exciting. Uh, yeah, I really, I did, I did enjoy this game. It's not quite a chase sequence like the end right. of 
Nightmare Frames, but it feels very similar. Like you are uh, up against it and having to think, well, you don't really have to think quickly, but the game makes you feel like everything's very urgent. You feel under pressure just because of uh, the terror of the moment. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like I want to, <laughs> I feel like it sounds like I didn't like the game and I do. I no, do. No, I, th- I think, what's I think it's happening coming across is, that you liked it. Yeah. I, I think what's really happening here is that I really hold nightmare frames high up there. Mm-hmm. And obviously I don't, I, I, I rarely like things equally. Uh, so I do like that one more. How would you feel if the dev listened to this podcast and then was like, oh, hey, sorry you didn't like <laughs> English hunting. <laughs> I'd be like, wait, no, I do <laughs> like it. I'm just saying my P. No, I really do like it. I, I yeah. highly recommend both of these games. They're super Thanks. high quality. They're super well written. And they're very, they're very point and click adventure. That's the structure yeah. that you are in. You know, you get fetch quests, you get um, inventory items, you get save slots, which is fantastic for me, especially as as somebody who might review these games like we do on like we do if we want to revisit a thing. And there's great dialogue trees. Uh, there's a sense of adventure the entire time. You're always finding new things. You're always opening up new locations, um, meeting new characters. It's uh everything you could want from a point and click adventure and the pixel art is amazing the soundtracks are great uh you mentioned the soundtrack earlier and when you compared it to gabriel knight i'm guessing you mean like the um the score that happens every now and then um Uh, uh, yeah uh but even like the setting so like in in bass for example that's super reminiscent of the police station in gabriel knight it's very close to me what I was going to say is much like the 80s music that you hear all throughout Nightmare Frames, there is period uh, accurate early 1900s records playing in many different places that you visit. Like you go to a store uh, or, or an you know, uh, office or something and they just have a record player playing like clearly a – in old uh, uh an old um early 1900s recording that has fallen out of uh copyright <laughs> yeah uh it really sets a tone yeah those were those were really great and by the way i should mention that the, these games are not voiced uh so oh, having right. i want to say that because we mentioned in both games there's music where somebody is singing uh, don't even worry about it. It does not interfere with anything because these games are not voiced. And part of me wishes that an English haunting was. I think because the portraits gave mm-hmm. the characters so much more personality and nightmare frames, I wasn't, there were facial expressions to match what they were saying. I got a little more character out of them. Right. Part of me wishes that uh, an English haunting was voiced though. Just a little part of me. Okay. I, w- I want to see where that could take it. You know, considering there's so many, there's different countries and different regions that we're in. Yeah, I just, I, I wonder about that. Well, who knows? This developer started with a Maniac Mansion kind of uh, inspired game, moved on to a Sierra SCI inspired game, then had a Gabriel Knight inspired game, and then maybe well, another sort of Gabriel Knight inspired game. Who knows? Maybe they are moving upwards. <laughs> through the yeah. evolution of adventure game history uh, and maybe their next game will be voiced i honestly i just cannot wait to see what this what postmodern adventures has next I, i'm going to start digging backwards and play billy masters was right and play uh urban cop story yeah. because i've loved both these games so much like I, it i am on the edge of my seat waiting for and it, it'll be you know two three years from now probably but i cannot yeah. wait to see what they come out with next no same I, I absolutely the same these games were a breath of fresh air for me i felt very yeah. excited playing them and i can't wait to see what they come out with next well that's an english haunting uh and nightmare frames seriously check them both out you're you'll be doing yourself a favor 
we have gone pretty long, so do you want to just say goodbye from this set rather than throw up? I will, I will concede to not hearing a third Swanky Maximino. I am in agreement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am um, agreed. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. Um, we are part of the Adventure Game Hotspot Network. Check them out at adventuregamehotspot.com. What else do we even say at the end of these things? Uh, 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 rate us. Uh, rate us. Give us a rating. And give us some ratings. Give, give us some us ratings. Rating. Share with a friend. You know, that that's something you could always do. Like, tell one person, like, yo, you would like this show. Uh, yeah, that for would sure. Be like wildly helpful um i'm gonna go tell all my friends (laughs) yeah have you not yet (laughs) uh i don't know (laughs) maybe um uh next week i think and you you guys can't hold me to this you cannot hold me to this oh my god but I think we're talking about uh, some of the games we got recommended way back in mm-hmm. episode. What was our last Q&A episode? 15, maybe? 14, 15? Yeah, somewhere around there. Uh, so if you guys go back, if you've listened to that episode um, and any of the games that were recommended us, yeah, it was 14, um, piqued your interest, check them out in preparation for next episode where we'll be talking about some of the stuff you guys recommended us. For um, sure. Do you have anything else going on, Roses, that you want to promote before we dip? Nope. <laughs> I got nothing. Yay! I got nothing. <laughs> Just this podcast, which you know what? I am totally fine with. I actually, if you guys are following adventuregamehotspot.com, uh, some of my, I'll be having some reviews actually popping oh, yeah. up. Uh, Good call. In the very near future. So um, if you want to read any of my written reviews, Go there. He's a good writer. He's a good jumper and a Aww. good writer. <laughs> I'm much better <laughs> at jumping, but thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. So we will see you guys next Wednesday. And uh, I personally, I don't know about you, Roses, but I personally think podcast is art. Well, I personally think that art is suffer. Well, let's agree to disagree. I, re- I really do think that. 